Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity to voice our support, the support of the uh, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops for H.R. 7, the No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion Act. This bill will write into permanent law policy in which there's been strong popular and congressional agreement for over 35 years. The federal government should not use its funding power to support or promote abortion. This principle has been embodied in the Hyde Amendment and numerous other provisions governing a wide range of domestic and foreign programs. It has consistently had the support of the American people. Women oppose federally funded or federally mandated abortion coverage as strongly as men or more so. Low-income Americans oppose it more strongly than the affluent. And even courts insisting on a constitutional right to abortion have said this alleged right, quote, implies no limitation on the authority of a state to make a value judgment favoring childbirth over abortion and to implement that judgment by the allocation of public funds, close quote. In 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court said the Hyde Amendment is an exercise of the legitimate congressional interest in protecting potential life, adding, quote, abortion is inherently different from other medical procedures because no other procedure involves the purposeful termination of a potential life. In other words, the federal government is perfectly within its rights, moral and legal rights, to say that abortion is not basic health care. The only mistake in the quote from the Supreme Court is its use of the phrase potential life. Uh, that has no clear biological or medical meaning. In fact, unborn children are actually alive until they are made actually dead by abortion. More recently, the Supreme Court has said simply that the government may express, quote, profound respect for the life of the unborn by regulating abortion. So the, the Supreme Court and the actions of Congress simply contradict Dr. Wood's testimony. She's talking about the government meddling, interfering, denying, making women lose coverage, setting aside the fact that the vast majority of women don't want abortion in their coverage. So saying they're losing the coverage like saying you're losing a tumor, uh, banning abortion, forcing. This is simply a governmental decision to uh, put its support behind the life-affirming options for mother and child and not to subsidize the lethal option. Congress's policy has been consistent for decades, but its implementation in practice has been piecemeal, confusing, and sometimes inadequate. Gaps or loopholes have been discovered in this patchwork of provisions over the years, highlighting the need for a permanent and consistent policy across the federal government. In 2010, Congress passed major health care reform legislation, which, as has been mentioned, puts federal funds into an entirely new part, a much larger part of the health care system for the first time. And that legislation has, as my longer statement details, at least four different policies on abortion funding, ranging from a ban on such funding in one section, on school-based clinics, uh, to a potential mandate for such funding in another. These problems have arisen partly because various sections of the Affordable Care Act not only authorize but appropriate their own funds, thus bypassing the Hyde Amendment and similar longstanding appropriations provisions. Recent developments underscore a need to correct the abortion funding problems in the Affordable Care Act. In 2010, the Act was used to approve direct federal funding of elective abortion coverage in the state high-risk pool program until that was uncovered by pro-life groups as state health exchanges have begun to operate. Americans are finding it difficult to find the plan without abortion coverage or even to get clear answers as to which plans those are. And they are discovering that despite public assurances to the contrary, they may in fact be forced by the government to subsidize other people's abortions as a condition for obtaining the health care their families need. Congressional employees and members of Congress are finding that if they want a plan without abortion in D.C., they only have a choice of nine out of 120, more than 120 plans. Uh, members and staff of Congress are previously assured they are free to choose from a full range of plans without abortion, are being deprived of that freedom or having it greatly narrowed, contrary, in our view, to longstanding federal law. We have submitted comments to the federal government on that point. 
If a bill like H.R. 7 had been enacted before the health care reform debate began, that debate would not have been about abortion funding. A major obstacle to support by Catholics and other pro-life Americans would have been removed, and the legislation would not have been so badly compromised by provisions that place unborn human lives at great risk. H.R. 7 would prevent problems and confusions on abortion funding and future legislation, and federal health bills, and I think a lot of us would be relieved at this, could be debated in terms of their ability to promote the goal of universal health care, real health care, instead of being mired in debates about one lethal procedure that most Americans know is not truly health care at all. Finally, in our view, and we'd be happy to discuss this, H.R. 7 does not eliminate private coverage for abortion, but specifically allows it when purchased without federal subsidy, and it does not create an unprecedented policy of denying tax benefits to abortion. The Affordable Care Act already broke that precedent by creating a system of tax credits for subsidies of coverage, which the Act itself referred to as federal funding. My prepared text provides additional details, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you.